Good afternoon. Most of you guys know and ladies know who I am. You see me hanging around here quite a bit. I'm dying to get in, but they won't let me in because I don't have any drug habits. I'm just crazy. Anyway, uh, what I do, I've been doing for quite some time now, over four years, is taking the residents out fishing on my boat or once in a while down by the house. I've taken some guys out golfing. But basically, this is about fishing. And the reason I'm here today is because you guys hear a lot of different things about when we go fishing and what happens. And it's like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I pick you up. I take you out down to the boat. You really don't know what's going on. You're not prepared. I asked some of the people here to have you guys have either a poncho or a rain jacket, not flip-flops, maybe sneakers, but you just come just sometimes not even with a shirt or a hat. And it makes it a little difficult because out there is not a little walk in the park. Now, there's all kinds of fishing, and I'm going to try and make this fun so we don't talk too much, and you guys see some of the things we do. Now, Hawaii Goes Fishing did a little film uh, that's been on TV over 300 times. They didn't give me anything for it. They didn't even give the kids a shirt. But uh, <clears throat> these are local kids in my fish pond where I have golden tilapia that I raise. And you'll see the first segment, it'll say, when Tommy D can't go fishing or the water's too rough, it's no problem, he can fish at home. So right to get started, I think, let's uh, hit that, fi that uh, DVD. And this is great for people who don't want to get seasick because you're not out on the ocean. Welcome to Hawaii Goes Fishing. Now, the weather isn't always perfect here in Hawaii, so sometimes to get a little angling action, you may have to head for the hills. For Tommy D, some of the best fishing tales are right outside of his back door. Our very own Margo Oshiro tours the bass hatchery at Wahio Middle School. And Lance Maragami takes Ben Leong on his first freshwater fishing experience on Lake Wilson. And when the weather finally turns nice, Walter Kuma takes his friend Neil Araki along for a day out in the ocean. Dave Lancaster presents a helpful tackle tip from Hanapa, Hawaii, and introduces a delicious real recipe from High Steakhouse. And speaking of eating, Mark Kimura shows us how to stop rust from eating up your trailer. So sit back and enjoy the action, coming up now on Hawaii Goes Fishing. There's nothing like spending some quality time in the great outdoors. But what if some of the best fishing action is right outside your door? Tommy D takes us on a private tour of his own backyard. Yeah, this whole area, it was all mud. The reason it was mud is there's artesian wells that came up. So being we knew it was running, we dug out. And every time we dug out, we put a rock in and did the perimeter of the pond. Then we planted the different trees and shrubbery and the roots grew, held it all together. Somebody gave me four or five golden tilapia and they multiplied into thousands very quickly. A few of the koi I got in the pet shop small and as you see they grew quite rapidly. The golden tilapia are hybrid tilapia. It's very nice white meat and most people do not know it's tilapia. These here are specially fed, and they are just very tasty fillets. Grandpa got one finally. Look, let's see if he could get it in. And a big catch of the day. <laughs> okay, you happy Tommy, I caught one. <laughs> for Tommy D, fishing usually means trolling out in the open ocean. But for this afternoon, he's taking some time out to share what he's learned with the younger generation. We dug some worms here before, but maybe we get some more. We 
could catch oh look at this one that's yours nice and easy keep going keep going oh, i got mine Woo. Whoa. how's that somebody's not getting their hands dirty okay off we go I guess a little later your two friends will be coming, huh? With a little patience and an eye on the floater, it doesn't take long before something bites. You need a worm? Again? I gotta put a hook on for him. I got him in the garage. In just a short period of time, the kids have it all figured out, and they're all on their own. Give me some fresh water. You guys are really doing good. We throw some of the little ones back. He's a golden tilapia. When they get bigger, they sell them in Chinatown for five with the pound. Oh, what does sister have? So, oh, she's got something good. Bring it away from the shoreline. You got a fish on there, but come on over here. Something's wrong. Come on over. Come on, he's loose here now. Up, up, and up, up, up. Come on, reel him. That's a giant one. Come on, reel. Go ahead. Up. Yeah, that's the one we wanted. <laughs> look at that. Grab your, here, grab that. Look at that fish. Connie, look at this fish she caught. What do you think of that? Wow, that's a great job. I think that's the biggest fish anybody caught out of here. Wow. This one, we're not throwing this one back. This is dinner. How was that? <laughs> All right, uh, as you see, those are just local kids, friends of mine from down by the pier, their grandchildren. And I take other groups who want to come down and fish in there. Those are my Great Dane dogs that watch the property. And everything I'm showing you now and everything they're going to be doing uh, kind of pretty much is the same stuff that you're learning in here. It's effort and discipline, those two words. For you to see what I have there, my fish pond, or when you're gonna see the guys on the boat, or what I'm doing right now, it took effort and discipline. There's a plan involved. So you guys have two and a half years here. I hope you're not gonna sit on your ass and do nothing, and that you use the effort and the discipline to use the tools that they're trying to teach you. And I'm gonna do it in the fishing department to show you. So we're gonna just do now another uh, DVD. It's a slideshow more than a DVD to music. And you guys are all in it. Some of them are not even here anymore. So uh, can we get that on?
does uh, anybody recognize anybody in that? Okay, as you see, that's quite a lot of fish. But there's really not too many really, really big fish in there because to catch really, really big fish, you have to have everything perfect, correct. If you don't reel correctly, the fish get away. If you reel too slow or if they run towards you, well, you'll lose them because they can throw the hook back at you. And basically, that's what this is all about. In a little while, the next little clip is going to show us putting some of the lines out and bringing some of these mahi-mahi in. And I brought some poles with me and some other things that we have here. And after the next little clip, uh, I'll show you some of those things that we have and what you're going to need and what I do supply when we go out on the boat. And then if you have any questions, feel free to ask me whatever questions you want. And uh, then we could actually even, if anybody's still further interested, we could go put some of the poles on Habilitat's so-called boat that I call a flower pot. And we could make believe that we're letting line out and reeling it up if you just want to try it. But you might see pretty much the next video we went out a couple of Fridays ago just to video this segment. So if you put that on, we'll... Aloha. This instructional video will provide some basic information on the use of deep sea fishing reels. This left view of the reel shows the clicker or the ratchet button. Again, the clicker button is on the left, the line on the reel spool in the middle. On the upper right is the spool release lever and in the middle right is the crank handle. This right side view of the reel shows the crank handle, the spool release lever, and the star-shaped metal wheel is the drag adjustment. Don't mess with this. Another type of reel. On this one the clicker lever lever is on the right side and shown with the yellow arrow. The maroon arrow shows the snap release. The snap release is also called a roller troller. Roller troller snaps are also run up the outrigger and center rigger poles on ropes. Captain Tommy Dodona will now give some instruction on using the reels. Okay, well, we're bringing one of the lines in. So this is a ratchet on this side. If I start the reel with the ratchet on, you can hear this noise. So what I'm going to do is take the ratchet and push it down, put my hand on the reel, and bring the line back and forth. You don't have to go super fast, but it's got to be that it doesn't bunch up. So that's what I want to do, is bring the line back and forth. And I'm going in a clockwise motion in a four inch off. And I'm bringing the line back and forth. Now normally if there was a fish on here, I would have my gloves on. But being there's no fish, I'm just bringing it in to show you how to reel it. This has a big lure on it for marlin.
Then I take the gap. That's one of my inventions. This is a snap swivel. This here, if a fish was to hit it, that would snap off. Being, this is like a clothesline. If a fish hit it, this is a snap swivel. It would come off, the reel would turn, and you take the ratchet off, and you go back and forth. your hand, your line goes back and forth, not to bunch it up. You can find a little crevice that doesn't have enough line and you can put some in there. Nice and easy reeling. Leave it about three feet so that you could come over, turn the pole, bring the line in the boat. Unsnap the swivel, take the hook off, and there you go. Then this here outrigger, you lift up and we turn it to put it in an upright position. Then we put this, this here stops the rope from going up or down. Then we have to do this one here is to bring this down so we could snap this off. And then put this back on so it stays in position. Then we reel this slack up. That's basically how it's done. This is a bird, and the lure gets attached to there, and this goes on the line. This is a small bird. That's a big bird. That's it for now. Look at our uh, captain here, uh, Steve. He looks like a turtle. Here's another demo. If a fish hooks up, the roller troller snap releases. Go to your pole and turn the clicker or ratchet off. Smoothly crank the reel handle with your right hand while moving the line back and forth on the spool with your left hand. The line is 100 pound test 
and the reels can hold up to 4,000 feet or three quarters of a mile of line. If the fish is large, you won't be able to reel in at first and it will be taking line out. As the fish tires, then reel in when you can. Keep steady, constant pressure on the fish. If you get tired on a large fish and can't reel anymore, let us know and somebody else will take over. If you just stop reeling, the fish could get off the line. Reel in until the bird, the ball, or the wire swivel is about a foot short of the rod tip. The fish is pulled into the boat or gaffed if it is large. When the line is let out, keep a slight pressure on the line spool with the left hand as the line goes out. There is a black mark on the line to indicate how far to let the line out for that particular pull. Turn the clicker on. Snap the line into the roller troller, but be sure not to pinch the line with a snap. Here's a short video on an actual hooking up and reeling in of a fish. Watch the tip of the rod on the right corner pole. When the roller troller snap releases, go to your pole and turn off the clicker. Reel smoothly and steadily with the right hand while guiding the line back and forth with the left hand. If it is rough seas as it is here, be sure to brace yourself against the side of the boat. Notice the pole on my right hooking up another fish. Get out of the way as the fish is pulled into the boat. Here's a few pictures of past guest fishermen that you might recognize and their catches of the day. So how'd you think about that? As you see, it, it's pretty bouncy out there and you gotta hold on a lot of times. Uh, so we've seen pond fishing, we've seen the residents who caught fish, and we talked about the effort and the discipline to do all of this. Then there's basically what I have down here is 10 things I have to ask myself, or you could ask yourself for whatever activities that you're doing. By the way, these Hawaii fishing news, there are some in the library, and uh, I guess you guys could look at them at if you are good, however it works. And uh, some of them, you, of you, they're in here with your catch. Because I send in some of the photos, and some of you are in the Hawaii fishing news. 
as well as some poems. You've seen in one of the video, it's dangerous out there. There was rope and you see us in the water. Well, we're 25 miles out at sea in eight to 10 foot seas and the propeller is caught on our, uh, I mean, the net is caught on our propeller and we have to go in the water one at a time and then take a gaff, which you could use a gaff. This is a short gaff here, which we take the rubber tip off and we hook a fish with or if you need to grab something or when we come into the dock area we use a pole that opens up with a little turn it opens up and you give it a little thing then we can grab the lines coming in we have to use these different tools these fans are old anyway don't worry about it <laughs> anyhow this is a pole and this is a gap so that's the difference between the two of these. When we go out there, I supply you with life preservers. These are really nice life preservers. I have about four or five of these. And then the old fashioned orange ones we carry. We have to have 14 of them on the boat because the boat is allowed to hold up to 14 people and you must, according to rules and regulations, carry the full amount. And so one of the things on here is, you know, you could be a sport or this could be an occupation. Now, you don't actually have to fish to be an occupation. You could have a tackle shop. You could work in delivery. You could work in a supermarket or whatever. If it's, no matter if it's sport or if it's an occupation, there's certain things you have to do to do it well. Planning is the most important. If you go without a plan, then you won't have everything you need with you. You won't do it well. Whatever you're doing today, if you don't have a plan, it's probably not going to turn out any kind of way because you don't have anything to go by. Now, the needs. What needs do we have when we go fishing or any other activity? You have to write down what needs there is. The type of fishing. Now, you've seen fishing from shore. That's the safest and easiest to do, but there are requirements. Here in Hawaii, other than on my property, you need a license to go in any of the lakes and streams or ponds. You have to have a fishing license. If you're an old fat like me and over 65, then you get it for free. But I wouldn't wait till then to try it. Then um, what type of your fish are you fishing for? You need to know that in order to have the correct tackle and the different things that you need. Then the clothing. Again, I always ask them here to have you guys bring a poncho or a rain jacket. It's okay if you have a sweatshirt, but then that's probably going to get wet because as you guys know, the waves go over the boat and it's a wet situation and it gets cold after a while. So if you could get a poncho or we could get some of the phone solicitors, Jeff, to call up different places and get three or four rain jackets, that would be very nice. Well, having them there and not bringing them is two different things. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and then <clears throat> safety. Safety is the most important thing that there is. That's why we have these life preservers. And if it's over 15 miles an hour winds, we all put them on. This is mine. It's got my name on the back. We put them on, and they're actually nice and comfortable because when you're bouncing around and you're hitting from side to side the pipes or anything else on the boat, it's nice cushioning because it really gets unbelievable out there. You're uh, in a 26-foot boat in 24-foot waves, that's saying something. And they actually pick up my boat, which is seven ton, and throw it like a surfboard. And some of you have seen that already or you've experienced that with me. When we go out, it's teamwork. There's no one person does anything. We're out on a boat and we have to survive. Just like you guys are family here 
and you just do things together as a team, it's a lot easier and a lot better. It's the same thing going fishing. When I was younger and stupid, I would go out by myself if I couldn't get anybody, and a lot of times people don't come back. I've lost quite a few friends who they don't want to take anybody with them, they don't want to share the profit of the fish, or somebody doesn't show up, and they do go out and they have a problem. They bend over or they gaff a marlin and the marlin pulls them in the water. That's it. The boat eventually comes back, but the person doesn't. You know, so I don't suggest going alone, and it's teamwork. Not one person catches the fish. We are not going into a tournament where one person has to stay on the pole, and the way that we fish the poles that you've seen, that you wouldn't fish in a tournament that way because you have to be strapped to the pole and sitting in a fighting chair with a harness on you on these poles. And if you see these poles, and you have a 500-pound fish on the other end, feel the weight of that pole. How would you like to hold that for three hours with a 500-pound fish on it? It's pretty heavy. So we do what's called a semi-commercial fishing where the pole holders are attached to the boat, and they won't come out, but they'll swivel whichever way the fish goes. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Am I going too fast? OK, and then there's many different types of lures. I showed you one that I made out of a, uh, an old jaw. I mean, people have different beliefs that you have to go out and spend a whole lot of money, and you don't. If, you, uh, if the fish are there and they're hungry and they're feeding, they really don't care what you put out, but some lures work better than others. Now this one here is an invention that I made with a double hook set up with enough line here to catch a thousand pound marlin. So that usually goes on the middle pole, and guess who the middle poles is mine. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I reel it in all the time. I let whoever didn't catch one get it. Now this was a bird that I showed you in there. A bird, there's different styles of birds. That's a big bird, this is a little bird, and this is a medium-sized bird. And what these birds do is they're hooked on to here, and then the hook and the leader, which is up to 12 foot long, will be at the end of that. This splashes around, and it simulates a splash or a fish, and then the fish that are swimming along in the school see it. And when they see it, they go over to it, and as you can see, it's marked up, but there's nothing for them to bite. And then they'll either hit a lure that's on the back that has skirts. They love to get tangled. So this is something that we work on all the time. And these here are just pieces that you could buy. There's hooks attached to it and we make them up. These have to be really, really sharp in order to penetrate the marlin. The marlin, you usually get them in the beak, very seldom in the mouth, and it has to penetrate. Ninety times you lose a marlin because they're so strong and they want to get away, and they'll actually rip all the way up as far as they can to get off. But sometimes you don't, and you hook them real good. This is a lure and it catches fish and it has no skirts, no color, no anything on it. And this is something that I made and it's caught fish. This cost me absolutely nothing. This cost $65 for just the head and then probably another with the hook and the skirts, another $25. And this catches just as many fish as that. So my idea is that fancy lures catch fishermen, hooks catch fish. <laughs> so that's my own particular feeling about that. Anyway, uh, this is what I wanted to show you, and we could, you know, get into it more. Any questions up to this point?
I've caught thousand pound fish. I used to fish for great white sharks in New York many years ago in the early 60s. So you've seen uh, Jaws. That was a true story. It wasn't held or it didn't happen exactly where they say, but basically was some kind of true story. Charles Mundus was one of the guys who really did that and he uh, moved to Florida and he died not too long ago but he was the person that you seen in the George film there was an actor but it was all about him and his boat I've been on those boats where giant sharks like that come and they'll rip the cleats off the back of the boat it's just incredible any other questions Uh, Bill, what happened is I usually took the gentleman out fishing and Bill went out with the other boat and he took the ladies fishing. And um, that boat doesn't move very often, so I guess that's why you're not going. You'll have to take that up with Jeff. Uh, Jeff and I spoke about it. If you show enough of an interest and you talk to Jeff, I'm sure we could work something out. Now, one of the things that I heard was my boat does not have a beautiful bathroom with a mirror in there and nice <laughs> smelly things for you. We just have what's called a piss bucket and we have a five gallon bucket for number one or number two, whatever the case may be. Now, the cabin's large enough that you could go in the cabin, you could do your business, we, then you take the bucket and you throw it into the ocean. So, you know, everybody goes to the bathroom. You know, we can't stay 14, 16 hours without going to the bathroom. So I don't see where that should be a problem. Yes? The bucket will be perfect. Um, but it pulls out wind, what is fish that you like to fish for? Like, what type of fish? What's the what? The most fun, uh, none of the fish is the most fun to me. They all work. The most fun is uh, the anticipating and getting everything ready and making sure the boat's in, working properly and do going out there and being on the ocean. The fish is a byproduct of the fishing. Fishing means doing the actual uh, thing that you're doing and the preparation and the going. It's not called catching, it's called fishing. Catching is a whole different ballpark. You're not going to be guaranteed of catching the fish no matter how well you do it if there are no fish there. You have to have fish. So I'm happy if we go out and you get to see nature, the, the sunrise like you've seen in the picture. Everybody participating in it and having a good day, that's successful. Okay, getting the fish is wonderful, but uh, it's not the main reason I go out. I need to get out into the ocean because I don't have any cell phone on. I have no radios on unless I need them. I have all kinds of safety equipment if we have a problem, but you're not allowed to use that safety equipment unless there's a real problem. You just can't call wolf because somebody doesn't feel well. I mean, you have to be where somebody's dying or somebody's in the danger of dying or the whole bunch of us drowning or something like that before you could push a button which will send a signal to a satellite which will send a signal to NOAA to come and investigate our situation. Any other questions? Who taught you how to fish? I'm still learning how to fish, and I've been doing it. I'm going to be 67 years old. Uh, I've been fishing since, I guess, four out at Montauk Point, New York. And I guess uh, uncles, friends, watching different shows and experimenting a lot doing a lot of experimenting and see what works. Uh, I used to go into uh, the little streams and rivers around where I used to live in Long Island, 
New York and catch trout and little fish and sunfish and do it that way. Uh, you know what? Let's get the guy all the way in the back. What allowed you to be so success successful? Like, what was your career off occupation before you, you know, before uh, you started fishing and stuff like that? Well, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, if you have the effort and the discipline and make some kind of plan on what you're going to do, you will become successful in it. Now, I was a general contractor, and I started uh, in the very beginning being an apprentice carrying lumber. So I carried lumber for six years and listened to all the crap from all of my bosses who was every carpenter, everybody who had a nail belt, I had to carry the lumber for them. So I had to be, uh, do that and do it long enough until they would allow me to pick up a hammer and then start to nail. So I would take a bucket of nails and go home at night and I would nail. And then when they gave me a chance to do it, they said, wow, this guy could actually nail. So it was the effort and the discipline I put into it which made me successful. Uh, my wife was here yesterday and she was talking to you guys about she was a roofer. Well, she came on the roof with me and ripped off pitch and gravel and worked her butt off, pushing the wheelbarrow on the roof and working with me. My son was in this program and he used to work with us as well. He now is working for a roofing company uh, in logistical support, taking care of their vehicles and all their equipment. But you could be successful in anything. Whatever is in your mind, and try and do something that you like to do. So, like, you see in my yard? I don't have a yard, man. Stanley doesn't come with you guys and cut my trees and takes care of the lawn and takes care of every one of those flowers. I built all that. I put every single thing in there. These poles, these were long poles. People threw these away. I shortened them. I put new eyes on them. I take the reel apart. Uh, this here is not a real handle. The real handles are $50, but they don't work as good as that stainless steel one that I made. So I get piped out of the rubbish can. I'm a dumpster diver. You know, I like to go and get stuff and recycle it and make things. So it's the effort and the discipline you put into things. Any other questions? Yes. So, I saw that you guys those, like, those huge fish that you guys catch. Yes. Actually, uh, you weren't here. I showed a film on uh, commercial fishing. It really doesn't take more than one person, but it's a lot easier to, uh, unless you're in a competition, there's no sense of really killing yourself. Some of these fish, take three and a half hours to reel in, and then at the back of the boat, you may have a half an hour fight that you aren't even going to want to believe. The fish wants to kill you. He wants to take that, that pointy thing, this here, and he wants to get you with it. Or an Ono wants to bite you, and he has teeth. They just don't want to jump in the boat and be served on a plate. They want to get away, so you really have to work at it. Yeah, do you go out Ikashibi? Do I go out what? Ikashibi. Handlining? Uh, actually, no. You see, handlining at night is a real good way of doing it, but I like my bed and my wife, so I try and make it that I'm in the bed and not somebody else at night. You know, and it, it seems to work well for me. I've been married for 36 years, so I think that's a good thing. You want to go Ikishibi, go ahead. I'm staying in my bed. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. I want to just say thanks for coming in today and, and sharing that with us. That's pretty cool stuff, man. Well, uh, you guys became family, too. See, we don't have any family here. I've been here for over 36 years, and uh, the family that did come, they wanted a free ride, and there's no free rides with me. So they didn't work. They got their ass kicked out. 
real quick because, you know, everything's about work. I don't sit around and do nothing. I'm always working. Any other questions? Yes. Do you look at fishing as a sort of addiction? Uh, no, I think golf is more of an addiction than fishing because at least fish you could eat. And I'm not crazy about fishing. This is not all I think about. This I, I, uh, I do it, if I could do it once a week, that's enough for me. And I enjoy eating fresh fish. I won't buy fish from a store and eat it because I don't like fish that smell like fish. I like uh, no smelly fish. If it smells, I'm not eating it. So I don't buy a fish from a restaurant or anyone else. Uh, you, I guess you could get addicted to it, but that's not a bad addiction. Well, see, I used to get in a lot of fights with my wife about fishing. It's kind of like gambling. You don't always hit the jackpot, and it keeps going back for more time. You hit that jackpot or that driver hit that big fish. I think you're on two totally different <laughs> elements here. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm talking on Earth, and you're talking out of space. <laughs> Gambling means losing. I'm, I want a sure thing. I do not gamble. If you want to make money, go work at McDonald's, start cleaning the garbage pails, and in 20 years you'll own a McDonald's. Go take that same money to a chicken fight, and you're going to be losing it, brah. So don't gamble. It's not the gamble. It's the attempt to get it. Well, that's, uh, I can see why you're here. And the whole idea is they're going to teach you what tools to use and, and not to be addicted to something. Like, I have a lot of friends that play golf. There's a dentist that you've seen in there that uh, was doing some of the demonstrations. I think some of you guys seen my first mate, Steve. Well, he's addicted to golf. When he's not being a dentist, he's on the golf course, and I'd say three to four times a week. And everything in his house, either it's lights up golf ball, or his telephone is a golf ball, or there's this is a golf ball, or he's got 500 different clubs. His garage is full of machines that have, you know, will take the bag, and he's got a little button, and it will walk along with you. He's got 500 putters. That's an addiction. You know, you could be addicted to food. You could be addicted. So uh, I think you have to uh, seriously check yourself out every once in a while and take accountability for your own actions and see if you went past. I talk now and again about uh, there's nobody good. There's really nobody good. Everybody has something about them that's not perfect. We all have faults. You know, if you really take glasses and look closely at things, hell, we don't look so good. So the same respect is you have to take a look at yourself and see where you want to be. You want to be in the green, and if you start to go over into the yellow, do something too much that's no good. Too much ice cream is no good. Too much steak is no good. But a happy medium in everything will be your best bet. That's the best way I could answer that question for you. Any other questions? Do you have experience in any other types of fishing, like fly fishing or anything like that? Um, not so much in fly, but freshwater spinning and bait fishing, I have quite a lot of experience in it. Uh, all of those magazines have Lake Wilson and the different activities that are here. Also in the back, uh, it'll explain to you about fads, which are buoys that are put out in different places, which is ledges out in the ocean, which just like when you look at the mountains, you see the different plateaus and then the mountain. Under the water is the same thing, so we start out leaving on a plateau, which over here is very shallow. And then once we get past the head buoy, it goes to 100 and something feet. 
and then the next ledge is 500 feet, then the next ledge is 1,000 feet, then it's 2,000 feet, then it's 6,000 feet, and we usually do a 100-mile round trip when we go out. So we're really going out there and then going back and forth and looking for balls of bait, signs in the water, rubbish, and that's where we usually find the fish. I see another hand. How much does the gas, oh, how much does the gas cost on these? Kind of expensive. Uh, I don't have gas. I use diesel. Uh, gas is uh, more expensive, and you use more of it, and it's extremely dangerous. The boat that Habilitat has is a gas boat. It'll cost you three times to go to the same place as I go, and my boat's about 2,000 pounds heavier than that boat, although they're the same size, because mine's diesel. Diesel's more efficient, and it doesn't have an explosive uh, property like gasoline has. One little cup, the size of that coffee cup, enclosed in an area the size of this podium, if the spark hits that, you don't have to worry about addictions or anything anymore. Because <laughs> it's just going to be a big blast, gonna, period. They're not going to find any of you. So that's a real dangerous boat. So most of the other boats that you see going out, those are diesel. Now, we use what's called off-road diesel. Off-road diesel means that the federal government is not supposed to tax it for repairing the roads. And it used to be quite a bit cheaper that way, but now it's gone up considerably, and they call it supply and demand, that it's not as cheap as it should be, and it's not because of the tax, it's because of the supply and demand. But basically it cost me about $140 for 12 hours of going out on the ocean all day with the motor constantly going. And sometimes we're chasing birds, and we're going as fast as we can, which on my boat will only be about hmm, 20 miles an hour. When we troll about 8 to 10 miles an hour. But sometimes the fish go with 60 miles an hour, so they just give you the fin and wave goodbye to you as they're going. Any other questions? In the back. Um, I do. I used to do a lot of diving around Mokomano, and um, I have a whole different feeling than I used to have when I lived in New York because that was the only real big game fish that we had at the time there. I believe, like the Hawaiians do, that sharks are a god, and they're definitely a necessary part of the ecosystem of the ocean and I don't have a problem with them. I don't think they eat Italians anyway because I've been with over 14 of them diving and none of them ever ate me. So, you know, what they do is they follow you around and the fish that break off the spear, they go after them. And once they do come around, we don't just stay in the water and wait to see if they want to taste us. We leave the water and give them their area. But basically, uh, I don't think they're really after us. But, you know, if you hang around and tease them long enough, it's, it's like anything else. If somebody's bothering you enough, you're going to do something to get them uh, their attention. And the sharks do it with their mouth. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I go out for one complete day. Usually we leave, um, so we reach the first buoy. The first buoy that we fish at is called a fad. It's the yellow buoy that you're seeing on there. There's about six of them on this side of the island, and they're positioned in different depths of water. The first one from the head buoy, that's the red buoy by the marine base, is called a head buoy or the home buoy. 
The first one is seven miles out straight north. And we want to get there just as the light comes up because I figured that they want to eat breakfast as soon as it gets light, the same as you guys want to eat breakfast. And if you're the first boat there, you'll probably get more action than if another boat gets there before you. So I go out according to, if it takes me two hours to get out to the first buoy, I like to leave at four if uh, it's going to be six o'clock. If it starts to, with the change of light and we don't have uh, where we put our clocks back, I have to adjust the time that I go out and sometimes I leave at five instead of four like I do in the summertime. As the winter comes winter, the, I go out later in the morning, but not usually after 5.30 in the morning. So we go to the first buoy. If there's fish there, we'll fish there, and we might come back with fish from the first buoy. If not, we go to the next buoy, which is 16 miles away from there. And then the next buoy is seven miles away from there, or eight miles. And then we have to shoot all the way to La Ie, which is about 16 to 24 miles to get to the LL buoy. So that's what we do is go from buoy to buoy. That's usually the route that the fish take, and sometimes you get a lucky strike in between. Any other questions? Yes, Natalie. I know Natalie because she'll be coming over to my house tonight, I think. She's going to be cleaning the windows and the doors. <laughs> Not really. She's been going to write poetry. Go ahead. Okay, hey, I would. Um, okay, so I imagine with going out and doing this, like, for as long as you have been, have you had, like, any kind of, like, close encounters or kind of, like, experience maybe one you can share with us or, like, maybe the waves are really high or something kind of crazy happened? Um, I've had quite a few, if you want to call them close encounters. Uh, We've had where we've gone out at dark and we're going towards Mokumanu, which is by the marine base. And we had some problems in the engine compartment, so I lift it up to stick my head down there and see what's wrong. And the next thing I know, my first mate's telling me, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, look, we're at Molokai. I says, we, how can we be at Molokai? We, we're just at the marine base. And we were at Molokai. Wow. And I mean, goosebumps came, they're coming on me now. I mean, we could see Kalapapa, and we were there. And then I, I don't know how it happened. And then two minutes later, all of a sudden, it was like, whoop, and we were right back to where we were by Mokumano. So that's happened. I've had water spouts follow us and chase us. Out for like 20 minutes straight, and we're going full blast to try and get away from them, and then they just die at the back of the boat. Uh, we've seen strange creatures in the water that we have no idea what they were. So there's a lot of different things that go on out there, and that's why you hear about fishermen having fishing stories or fishing tales. Well, when we go out, you may not come back. That's always a possibility. You may not come back. So if you think uh, everybody comes back, that's why I really put all this emphasis on safety, life preservers, GPSs, radios, making sure your equipment is up to date. And you don't, I always check the boat, start it up, look for leaks, and make sure everything's going before every single trip, or I will not go out. Because it's not like a car where you could just pull over and wait for somebody to come by and, hey, bro, you need some help. Nobody's going to help you unless you call one of your fellow fishermen. But as you guys know, sometimes we don't see a boat for the whole day. There's nobody to see. When we hit the net, we were in the water for an hour and a half cutting lines and trying to get out of that situation. No one came to our help. We had to get out of that situation ourselves. Any other questions? Anybody want to go fishing? Yeah. Well, uh, if you want to, like I said, after this is, uh, this is just about over, 
if you want to see some more demonstrations, have any hands-on feel of the polls, or have any personal questions you want to ask me, I'm here. So feel free to, to do that. Uh, I don't know. Where'd Jeff Hart go to? Oh, uh, we'll leave him, leave him in his office. That's fine. So that's it for me, unless you have any other questions. Do you have any other questions? So again, in recapping, it doesn't make any difference if it's fishing. What, what sport do you like? Yeah, you. Baseball. You like baseball. I like to fish, too. But you like baseball? Yeah, I like baseball. Did you ever want to be a baseball player? Um, yeah, at one point. Did you do anything to pursue that? Okay, so you were doing some, putting the effort and discipline into it. Yeah. Okay, you got sidetracked or you wouldn't be here, right? I would have seen you on TV. Yeah. So anything that you just want to do, anything. I may appear like, you know, I come with a Bentley. I have a boat. You see me with gold on. You know, I came here broke with only $10,000, a new wife, I had a bad situation with a family before that I was in for 10 years. And I came here because I knew that I could do anything it is that I wanted to do if I got rid of the distractions. So in an Italian family, you have about 500 cousins and aunties and uncles, and they won't leave you to hell alone. So I left them and I came here and I started a roofing and siding business, working for somebody in the beginning, and then building it up and building it up. And I'm retired 16 years now. And everything I have, I own. I don't have payments. I busted my ass. My wife broke her ass. When you see her put on a demonstration like she did for you yesterday, that took her a month of it sounded like somebody at my house was gone with the wind was playing or some mass murder of Charles Manson was there. That's her practicing. She practices it and practices it and practices it and goes to many groups and writing classes and all. And all of you guys could do the same thing that I do. I tell you when you come out on the boat that there's nobody good, there's nobody better than you, that what you have that I don't is youth. And I would give anything I have. Matter of fact, I'll sit in your chair. You could go home to my $4 million mansion and live there with my dogs and work your ass off over there. And I'll stay here to be your age. Because I'm in the last third. You know, everybody only lives so long. And that's why I work out and watch what I eat and don't eat some of the crap food that you guys bring out on the boat because I'm trying to live long enough to enjoy the Social Security that I'm getting and the other benefits that I made for myself. It wasn't luck. I didn't go to Vegas, and I'm going to Vegas on the 5th, but I'm not going to go there to gamble. I'm going there to see the incredible shows. I spent $900 already on just shows. We see sh one show a night. We're going for five nights. We're going to see five shows. If I pass one of these machines, the Wheel of Fortune, and I feel inspired, I'll put up to 100 bucks in it. And I usually do pretty good and come back with at least a wardrobe for free. I do have some kind of luck. But the main luck is, whatever it is that you have, save it for a rainy day. Don't spend it. If you don't need it, don't buy it. You don't need all this crap. You don't need to have a phone in your ear all the time, because then it means you're not doing something to help yourself. That's all I could tell you. If you have any other questions, you could ask me, but basically that's what it is. <clears throat> All of you could do whatever it is you want to do it if you put your mind together. You have a gym here that you could use. That's a great gym. 
I went in there and worked out with Jeff once. I have my own gym home, but I don't have the poundage. And once in a while, I like to <clears throat> do some deadlifts with three or 400 pounds, and I don't have that much home. <clears throat> so it's good to have that gym. And the exercise classes you have upstairs and all of that. If you go to other countries, you're going to see that they have the whole workforce in Japan go up on the roof and do calisthenics in the morning. Because if your body is not together, then your mind's not going to be together. When you go out fishing, I've had guys who go out fishing who are a little bit overweight, and they can't hold their own ass up on the boat. And I tell them, you know what? You better stay away from the freaking potato chips, you know? So there's, that's all I could tell you is the truth. The truth is work at it, work at it every day. If there's a, you don't have a plan, make a plan. Even if it's simple, make a plan, write it down, put it where you can look at it every day, and you will become successful at whatever it is you want to do. End the story. All lures, bro. Hit some big boys with these. Gonna catch one of these when I go out. What are you guys doing? We're che like checking this out. It's so uh, oh, fishy. We're gonna go fishing on it. Yeah. I knew this is a nice one. Gonna learn. <laughs> Who's that? This is a big deep sea real fishing pole. It's real, this thing weighs about like 20, 25 pounds. It's nothing like that pole, nothing like a fly pole that weighs less than a pound. I'm going to come back in a minute once I hook this up on the show. Okay, so let's say you, there you are, you got a fish, it's fish hit now. You're going to grab the reel, keep this line here, it's going to go back and forth, and you're going to... Yeah, this way first, yeah? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, ho. Okay, how's that feel? Feel good. All right. I like that. Take it back out. Anybody else want to try? Thank you. Then this goes back up to the strike zone. Anybody else want to try it? Come on. Is it killing me with these cigarettes? <laughs> we just talked about good habits. Come on up. These poles are not the same. Th this is the line, and you're going to crank, and you're going to bring. See, if you have this here, and you use your thumb, you could go back and forth. Go ahead. Yep. It's a big one! <laughs> All right. Doesn't matter how fast you do it? Okay, hold. Oh. That's just to give you an idea. Oh, so that's like, so release it, like if it's getting too tight. Okay, bring it up. Now, no, see this here has a drag, watch. 
If I go up with this, and the fish is real big, look, he's going to take the line out. Oh, okay. It's set for 25 pounds. That's 10 pounds. If I want to set it for less, then watch. You see how that, go ahead, crank it. I got it set for less. Look, it's now it's going to take a 10 pound fish, but watch. Now I'll make it a five pound fish. Go ahead. It's not going to, it won't reel them in. It's too light? It's, right, I have the drag set. That's why we could catch a thousand pound fish on a hundred pound line. So if it's a thousand, you move it all the way forward? If a thousand, I would leave it as far as I could, yes. All right, so depending on the size of the fish, you change right. that. Right, correct. Okay. All right. Sweet. You can disconnect it. Now this boat is really not set up like mine set up because it has, it's too low for this handle to do the turning. Okay, over there, they're too low and they don't have swivels. So either he has an additional piece that's not here or his butts. Let me see if his butts are bigger. I'll show you what I mean. This is one of his poles. Yeah. You see the difference in the height of the butt? So mine's cut lower. Mine's made for my particular one. And this is still too big. It's a 12 -0. Huh? This is a 14-0. That's a 14-0. And this is a 12 0, that one there. The biggest reel in the world is a 16 0, which is exactly the same diameter, only it's got a wider spool. Okay, take that, put that by my truck. Oh, you see, look, I gave this to Bill, so that's why it's on Bill's pole. I invented this. Yeah, this is one of those plastic jobs. Where's that weight? Put the weight on that. Put the weight on that. You know what, you could just put the weight, bring them all the way to the building on the concrete. Okay, okay your name? Crystal. Crystal, come here. This is where the fish would be, and there's a fish that's bite, that just bit the line and the snap came off. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take and crank this. Now, remember, remember that noise? That's a ratchet over here. That's to notify you that there's a fish on. If you're sitting over here and you're not watching anything, you'll hear that noise going out. That's to let you know that there's a fish on. But when we want a reel, we shut that off. Then you come over here and you could turn the reel and guide the line slowly back and forth. Watch out, it's not that easy. That's only 10 pounds. Go we'll try, oh, you get broke up. I'll do it. How is it? That's only 10 pounds. The golf ball splashes in front of the hook, make it assimilating. That's all right, no worry. Good, see, you keep it steady, pressure and going back and forth. I want to take her out. Go ahead. Keep going. Oh, no. Oh, oh. oh no. Well, come on. 
Okay, oh, wait. Okay, watch. Okay. That means it's set for 10 pounds. So we're going to give it a little more and now see what happens. Oh, then I get the fish, I take it all. Okay, now, if I was to let this go, I have to hold on to this. And I can't even move this because there's too much strain on the, on the spool. So I'll just take the star drag, let the strain off. Then I could, after I let the strain off, then I could do that, put the ratchet back on, take it back out again. Thank you, Mrs. Fish. That's the noise it would be making, right? Hey, you don't have to hold that all the time. Go throw in my truck. The pole. Okay, who wants to, anybody else want to try it? These are all professionals. Come on up. Can you guys put this in my truck, please? Uh, in the bed's fine, laying down. Okay, the fish hit. What are you gonna do? You forgot something. What? This. No, you don't ever touch that. The okay. ratchet, the noise. Okay. Okay, now yeah. there's no noise. And I can just grab it like this. Well, right. actually, you want to have it that you're stabilizing the pole, mm -hmm. and you're going to bring the line like this. See how I'm bringing it slowly but steadily? Go ahead. That's 10-pound fish. So you see how it feels. That's only 10 pound fish. Now he's fighting. They don't just come like that. But you see the way that the strain is on the pole? Mm -hmm. You want to keep it steady and keep strain on it. Yes. No, no, that's, that's a good, good question. You need to do that when you're fighting, really fighting a fish. We're doing it commercializing it by not taking the pole hole out because I have special kind of holders that twist. Okay. You see this top here that moves? Yeah. Okay, this pole does it, the others don't. But I have swivels that are in here that move. So if the fish go runs over that way, this doesn't stay stationary. This follows them. So I could just stay here and it saves my back. No, but what you do is, if it's really big, 300, 400, 500 pounds, right? So this is set only for the most you're going to turn this is maybe 60 pounds. So how, how do I do it? I grab the line, and I grab the line like this, and I grab the line, and I grab the line. That's why we always have gloves on, and I grab the line. See how that's coming up? And I grab the line and I grab the line, and you do that, and it's out a mile, and he's fighting. Then he comes all the way up to the boat, he sees you, he goes, and he's gone. gone again, yeah. And you'd fight him for the rest of the time. So this here is what's called a down rigger. You see this big lead? This is no. So all this does is we would have another with another line that would be hooked to this with the, either a hand line or a crank yeah. and we have a roller troller let me see if bill has roller trollers this is a roller troller so this you want to go right in the middle of this and then you snap this shut so then there would be one of these on this and you would let it down maybe 60 feet 
Then you put your lure on, and then the lure would be going 60 feet underneath the boat for the fish that stay under. What they fish these under? Uh, all of them do. But then this here is on the roller troller, right? Yeah. And what will happen is the fish hit, it snaps off. You follow what I'm saying? So that's what this is. We used to use rubber bands in the old days, but when you do with the rubber band, you can't then decide to let out line or bring line in because the rubber band is st stuck. So, and then it's a pain in the ass with the rubber bands. So that's how the pole bends. See the pole bends? Do you need all these poles yourself? Uh, I, I get them and I recondition them. Doesn't have to be like a long pole then. You know? The old days was the longer poles. It's all corded. If you're going whipping yeah. off a off the shore, you need a long oh, pole so you can, so you can whip, whip that way. bugger out and get him way out there. Yeah, this is one of mine. Yeah, it's just a, a you know if you're practicing golf, you don't want yeah. it to go too far. So I drill a hole through it. I put a rubber sl uh, sleeve in there, and then that'll splash along, and then I hook the lure onto it. It's funny that, it's funny that when, when you said about the golfing and stuff, because I remember being little, and my grandpa used to drill these small little eyes into the regular golf balls to fish offshore on right. rough water, and right. then call it kakelea, right. and it bounces off, yeah. off the bottom. Same principle. Okay, you can put this in my truck. This too in your truck. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay. We're done here, cameraman. Okay. The fish hit. Oh. You're going to be bouncing up and down, holding on to everything. I go slightly. Why is this rail?